come, brother. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much for all the good work that you do. Uh, Barakallahu feekum. Uh, I start by greeting you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi uh, with all the titles and uh, positions uh, in place. Barakallahu feekum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala asahti khalqihi wa khatam rusulihi Muhammad. صلى الله عليه وآله رضي الله عن المهاجرين والأنصار ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد I wanted to um, talk with you about the topic obviously of our conference mental health and resilience and I had planned to approach this topic from a Quranic perspective so that we can learn lessons from the Quran based on the methodology that we call in the Maqasid Institute, Maqasid methodology, on how to deal with issues of mental health and resilience. And in the context of what is happening these days in Palestine, I thought that I cannot talk about the Quran as a teacher and we have a, a marvelous teacher. We have one of the most important teachers of the Quran today in our media, and we see them every day. Who are the people of Palestine? The people of Palestine are the best teacher that could teach us about mental health and resilience from a Quranic perspective. This is a Quran walking on earth as the Prophet ﷺ was. Aisha said, anha, he was a Quran walking on earth. The inheritors of the Prophet are the scholars, people who dedicate their lives to study the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger and to benefit people with knowledge. These are inheritors of the Prophet. But the highest level of the inheriting of the Prophet is the level of people who do jihad in the way of Allah, people who fight against oppression, people who go through a lot of difficulty because of the lack of balance today between truth and falsehood. They endure a lot of mental health problems. Look at the hunger that is happening in Gaza today and the mass killing and the mass arrest and the mass uh, abuses for our sisters and children and our brothers, of course, in Palestine. And you see an example of how the Quran could give you a very high mental health and give you a very strong resilience. A big question is, are you saying that when you are a good Muslim, you don't have mental problems? And the answer is no. You could be an excellent Muslim and you could still have mental problems. In fact, you could be a prophet and you have mental issues and you have psychological sicknesses. Um, I was just reading in Surah Yusuf, alayhi salatu wa salam, فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ وَقَالَ أَسَفَ عَلَى يُوسُفُ وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كَظِيمُ Ya'qub, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was so sad about Yusuf that he lost his sight. This is a psychological pressure that impacted the physical existence of a prophet of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَرِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ In Surah Al-Kahf, he told him, you are killing yourself by being sorry about their disbelief and about their denying of the truth. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so sad about that and about his people rejecting the truth 
to the extent that Allah told him, do not kill yourself over it. You're going to get yourself sick over it. So the answer is no. If you have the best Iman and the best relation with the Quran, you could still be sick. We are going to be dealing with a lot of mental issues as well with our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Uh, inshallah, when they come out of this war, we are going to be dealing with a lot of trauma and a lot of issues because of all the injustice and the brutal uh, violence and the inhumane dealing that they dealt with. Uh, we, when we take captures of war, we feed them and we take care of them. And this is what the Quran is telling us. And this is part of our resilience and our mental health and our preservation of the mental health of our captives. And that is the stories that the captives of the enemies are saying about their captivation. Uh, they were not tortured. They were protected. They were. They came out with uh, almost a better mental health than the mental health they had before being captive. Uh, versus enemies who have no uh, faith and have no motivation for good and shayateen al-ins wal-jin as Allah said some of the people could be shayateen could be satans uh, who torture their captives with no reason and just try to break them and make them sick mentally and to break their resilience we are seeing a lot of resilience in Palestine why because al-iman faith al-Quran is mental health. It is like when you are a healthy person, you exercise, you eat good food, you are always active, and then you get a flu. The impact on the flu on you is going to be much smaller than when you are not a healthy person because you don't eat well, you don't exercise, you don't breathe good air. Uh, some people smoke and do intoxicants and so you become an unhealthy person. So when you get a small sickness, you are not resilient because you don't have the immunity, you don't have the strength, and you are ruining your health. Similarly, the mental health is the same thing. If you are a good mu'min, if you have reliance on Allah and you understand ibtila, and I will talk about a few issues, and you have a high level of faith, you have higher immunity of being sick and you have higher possibility of finding cure. The uh, Quran is not going to um, cure you by itself. Similarly, the exercise is not going to cure your flu or COVID or any of that. But because you are healthier, you are able to stand on your feet. The Quran makes you healthier mentally. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about when he talks about health and sickness in the faith sense. In the first page of Surah Al-Baqarah, They have sickness in their heart. This is not a heart disease in the muscle. This is a heart disease in the psyche of the person. The disbelievers, the deniers of the truth, the liars, the Quran is saying, يكذبون, they lie. This lie is a mental sickness. Maybe it is not classified like that in our secular psychology today, but from the Islamic point of view, when you lie, you have a mental sickness. When you are a disbeliever of Allah, if you don't know the truth, maybe Allah will forgive you or will consider you to be ignorant. But if you know the truth and you reject it, and therefore you become a kafir, you become a rejecter, a denier of the truth, someone who fights against the truth, that is sickness in your heart. Disbelief is sickness in the heart. 
and is a psychological problem from an Islamic point of view. And when you have a good relation with the Quran, you have more resilience to fight uh, sicknesses like that. And you have more ability to recover if you ever get sick because of a trauma. You lose a loved one. Uh, we see a lot everywhere, Muslims and the Muslims. If their belief is not strong, even if they're Muslims, they, br they break when they lose a loved one. And they just, you know, lose their life when they lose a loved one. And this morning I was watching a child from Gaza. She must be eight or nine. And they told her, where is your dad? See, she said, in Jannah. And, and she was resilient. We're talking about resilience in this conference. This is a resilient kid. She's nine. And she's saying, very simply, he's in Jannah with a smile on her face. This is a lesson to be taught in universities. We need to research this. We need to research how come a nine-year-old standing in a refugee camp while being bombed and massacred by white supremacy and their pigs in Israel, how is she standing on her feet and saying that she is fine because her father is in Jannah? This is how you understand resilience. How did she get to that? She understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a maqsid, has an objective of basically um, ibtila. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. He created death and life so that he gives you a trial, a test. Allah made us in this world to test us. Who is doing good? He has a wisdom that doing good is going to be better for the earth, is going to be better for us. Yes, it is a minority that is going to be doing good, but he has a maqsid, he has an objective, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he gives us this test so that we have a choice to do good or to do evil. And if we do good, then we are amongst the excellent few ones who are successful in this life and the next. And if we do evil, like most people, we fail the test. And then justice is going to get us in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this understanding so that we are resilient. Because if I know that this is just a journey and I am here on a test and I need to succeed in the test by saying the truth, by doing good deeds, by being good to people even if they are evil to me, by fighting uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on all fronts, not just the usual jihad, but every kind of jihad, the intellectual jihad, and the jihad in the society, and jihad in the family, and jihad with the children, and jihad with the parents. I am doing all of this because of that ibtila from Allah. That gives me strength and mental health and resilience to be able to overcome the challenges. And that is one of the immunity that the Quran gives people when they understand the reality of life, when they put life in its place. This little kid I'm telling you about, she is comfortable because she really, really believes that her dad is in paradise. Uh, this is not just philosophy. She, she firmly believes in that. Do not think that those who die for the sake of Allah are dead. They are alive. She really believes that he is alive. And this is giving her a way to cope. If she was a child who doesn't believe in anything but the material world, she would not be able to cope. 
she would think that her father simply disappeared or he became uh, dust under the earth or he will, I don't know, uh, reincarnate into a snake or something. That is different when she understands that because of justice and because of the Islamic paradigm of life and death and hereafter and Jannah and Nar, then we are not, we don't disappear. When we go to Allah, we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we go to him in a good way, then it's a good day in our lives. It's not a bad thing to die for the sake of Allah. This is resilient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also is teaching us a tawakkul, to rely on Allah. You are going through a tough time of poverty or a tough time of sickness, physical sickness, or as I said, losing someone or being challenged by something. And then you rely on Allah. That relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the reasons you have immunity from mental problems and you have strength that you can deal with mental uh, challenges. You rely on Allah and if you know very well that Allah is the strong and he is a razaq subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who provides and he is subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who has the keys of heavens and earth. And he is just limiting my providence these days. Uh, I am in a hospital, but I know that Allah will cure me. Uh, I lost someone, but I know that Allah will give mercy on them. Uh, I feel injustice in my place of work, in my studies, in my family, but I know that Allah will give me victory. And I know that justice is the law. And I rely on Allah based on that. That reliance on Allah is resilience and is going to help me through my challenges. I might still need an expert to analyze my problems and try to help me. But as I said, this is like eating well and exercising. And when it comes to physical uh, problems, you, you are strong enough to pass your problems because you eat well and exercise. The exercise in Islam is the Iman exercise, what you might call in English, the spiritual, the heart exercise. My heart is strong because I have a good relation with Allah. I rely on Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, also there is a concept that is very important in Islam, which is a sabr, uh, patience. Sabr is something that you learn. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you sometimes with small thing. And then you learn to endure, to be steadfast, to have sabr, to be sabr. As-sabirun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talked about this group that he called the patient people. And when you have sabr, in Allah ma'a sabirin and you know that Allah is with you, Allah is ma'ak, that gives you strength against oppression, gives you strength against sickness, against loss and trauma, against aggression. It gives you strength when you have sabr. And sabr makes a difference because it will allow you to spend that extra hour of fighting back before victory. It will allow you to spend that extra day of saying Alhamdulillah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away the test from you um, and, and relieves you. A sabr is also a very important concept. A shukr, when you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is also a very important concept. And that is part of our psychological health and our immunity. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he promised us that when he, we thank him, he increases us in our blessings. So in the time allowed to me, I am just saying that, uh, yes, there is a difference between being a good believer and having a good relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mental sickness and mental health. But being a good believer and having a good relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the strength, 
gives you the muscles in your heart and in your mind and your psyche by which you can deal with trauma and you can deal with problems. And at tawakkul and the sabr and the shukr and the iman and the quwa and all of the good values of Islam are the foundation of good health. And people who lose faith and lose the values, they become more vulnerable because any small test breaks them. People break, people you know, commit suicide. They can't live like that. Versus a believer who is firm in his or her belief and live in the most miserable conditions, but they are strong and they are resilient because their reliance is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their heart is strong because of their faith. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory to the oppressed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us and to forgive us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Prof. Yasser, every time we hear your uh, speech and your lecture is actually also at the same time can calm ourselves. So, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So, yeah, and yeah, it really, it really means a lot and it really just go into our ourself yeah and prof it proved that many questions are receiving in our chat box so oh, no. okay so prof allow me to read uh some question prof you read all what right. because i don't all see right. all the yes yeah, okay so the first question uh, let me check once again so the first question is from our brother or sisters in bangladesh prof uh he or she is the student of sheikh muhammad Holtz at Hearts SEE International, perhaps you recognize him because he or she knows you about him, from him. And the question is, how can Heart Center, Heart Center Islamic Leadership infuse with the strategic of Makassid thinking, contribute to addressing the challenges faced by Muslim communities worldwide? Oh, wow. Uh, Makassid thinking is a big topic. Uh... Let me answer with a book that I put for you here uh, that I wrote recently and I spoke about in a couple other occasions uh, in, uh, in, in conferences uh, here and there. And it is called uh, Re-Envisioning Islamic Scholarship in which I talk about how we can rethink uh, scholarship based on a maqasid approach to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so this is my answer to approach the Book of Allah looking for clues on how to deal with issues of research and science and uh, contemporary challenges and phenomena. And it's a long story. That's why I put the book here. I uploaded it on the chat. Please download it from there. MashaAllah. Barakallah, Prof. Yasser. Barakallah. And the next question is coming from our brother is the question is learning from Palestinians, brother and sisters. So please kindly recommend the psychological approach to make people not just aware about Iman, but also to have behavior that align with the belief or the Iman itself. Yeah. Well, uh, Islam, Islam is not only for Muslims. Uh, and the Quran is not only for Muslims. A non-Muslim could also learn from the Quran. Uh, even though the most important, in our view as Muslims, the most important lesson that you learn from Islam is to believe in God. But even if you're not a believer in God, I see a few questions here. If I if I don't have the faith, then I lose everything. No, you don't lose everything because you could still learn patience. You could learn to rely on God. And even if you don't believe in, in God, you rely on the, the, the force that created this universe uh, or you rely on the sense of balance and justice in the creation of the universe and so on. Uh, I would advise you though to think about faith because faith does make a big difference in mental health and in psychological resilience. And any look at what's happening in Palestine would give you evidences here between people who have faith and are able to endure a lot of pressure and a lot of issues and people who do not have faith. But as I said, Islam is not only for Muslims, 
non-Muslims could benefit from the wisdom uh, of Islam and the wisdom of uh, everything that would be said in this conference. I know that people who are experts, uh, I know that, uh, for example, Prof. Bagus is going to be speaking after me. They will give you a lot of ideas, whether you're Muslim or not, you can benefit from that in your psychology as practice and uh, as knowledge. Okay, thank you, Prof. And um, this is another um, question from our sisters in Philippines, Prof. So the question is, uh, Prof. Yasser, you talk seems to point to faith, to faith as a foundation for resilience. So the question is, are there other options? Well, other options, uh, foundations for resilience. Uh, in my personal experience, uh, I couldn't find a better option than faith. Um, of course, uh, there are many things that people use for resilience. Um, arts, uh, community work and community um, connections with people, uh, family. Um, you, you see, there are so many factors that people could rely on, something that you can rely on. But for me, reliance on Allah is the real reliance, uh, is the most effective reliance. But of course, there are so many things that Allah created that make us more resilient uh, by uh, relying on them, uh, relations and people and, and so forth. But he is the foundation of every power and the foundation of every strength. And therefore relying on Allah uh, is really not an option for me, is not an option for people who want to be resilient and to be strong and to be genuine uh, in their life in this world. Okay. So, and the next uh, question, Prof, uh, this is Kavi again, uh, then Francis Kepio as well. Uh, so suppose it's a brother, yeah? So, Prof Yasser, I find it surprising that to be resilient, we must assume that a personal deity will give us strength. Won't that be merely um, deception on our part? Sure, believing in a high power, that's something good, but what about those who have neither faith or nor believe in any deity? So the fact that they have that yet killed themselves in a purely absurd world is also a testament of their strength. So are they any psychology resilient when compared to someone who is religious? Yeah. Um, well, um, of course, uh, you, you know, Allah in his mercy, gave people a lot of good, whether they believe in him or not, uh, whether they believe in the one who created heavens and earth, or they don't, and they go about their lives uh, to enjoy it, Allah still provides for them physically and mentally, uh, still gives them food to eat and water to drink, and still created mates for them to enjoy their lives. And he, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, gave them uh, so much that they can work with. Uh, this is, you know, Allah doesn't shut his mercy from those who even deny his existence. Uh, so that's, that's how I see it. I don't take faith from people's whims. I take faith as truth. Uh, faith is the truth that we can measure other truths with. Uh, if you are someone who is locked in Greek philosophy, uh, you are going to think in a way that is very limited, and therefore you are going to hinder yourself from achieving faith. Or if you are someone who is locked in a postmodern world, where people define anything, you know, they wake up in the morning and define their gender, they define their, their animals or not, they, you know, this kind of world, in a postmodern world, you will not be able to find God because you are going to put yourself in too many illusions about the world. And if you are someone who is looking into yourself, 
and not following a particular machine of logic. And I used to teach logic, by the way, I know what I'm talking about. And you're not following a particular machine of logic. And you're just asking your heart about your life and your destiny after death and about the creation and the balance of the universe. You are going to reach God. And when you reach God, you are a very, very different person. And your psychology and your resilience is a very, very different psychology and resilience. That's my answer. And uh, peace be with you. No problem. <laughs> Okay, Prof. And perhaps this is the last question, Prof, uh, because we have some limitation in time. But this is the last question from our sister in New York University, Abu Dhabi, Prof. So the question is how to sensitively approach the issue with the following belief some Muslim have. For example, like if my mental health is poor, my iman must be weak. So when the same belief doesn't apply when physical sickness is observed. No, no. If you if you have a mental problem or you are sick, it does not mean that your faith is weak. This is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that if you work on your faith, it will give you strengths. It will give you mental muscles by which you can overcome your sickness. You see, it is like uh, you have uh, a lot of COVID and you are dealing with COVID and you are trying to uh, avoid the problems. But if you are an athletic person, it is proven you can overcome COVID in a better way because you have muscles, because you are stronger, because you eat well and you don't smoke and you don't drink, etc. You have a higher chance to overcome COVID, you see. So the mental health is there, uh, the problem, and you are dealing with it with your doctor, with your counselor. Um, you might need some medicine or you might need some counseling. You are going to do that. But if you also take care of your Iman and you strengthen it, you have a higher reliance on Allah, higher sabr, you pray, etc. It will give you muscles. It will give you the ability to see the world in a way that perhaps would help you deal with the trauma and deal with the sickness you have, physical or mental. Because faith is actually a source of strength uh, is a source of health it doesn't mean to be the only source there are many other sources allah created as i mentioned but i'm here to talk about islam as a faith where it could give you strength and gives you the fantastic examples that we see today in palestine of resilience despite all the oppression Yeah, Alhamdulillah, Prof. Yasers. So, yes, indeed, we have to practice our iman, our heart, our sabar, and everything. And we must put as the faith is our foundation or our strengths to be more res resilient in the future. Alhamdulillah, Barakallah, Fik, uh, Prof. Yasers, for sharing with us in the IPC MHR. It really means a lot to us. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. Love bless. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so yeah. profs, so we still have Lovely. the recognition session, prof. Oh, wow. as the re <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, as the recognition and also the appreciation from the IPC MHR committee, we would like to give a token of appreciation to sure. Professor Yasser Auda. So in this occasion, we would like to welcome Ibu Dr. Dewi Sartika as the conference chair of IPC MHR and also the dean of the SAC of the Faculty of Psychology at Universitas Islam Bandung to give a token of appreciation to Professor Yasser Auda. Please welcome Dr. Dewi. Thank you so much, Professor Yasser Auda. Thank you so much. Thank you for participation in this webinar. Thank you for inspire, inspiring presentation. Uh, we hope that one day we will meet uh, offline in UNISBA at UNISBA Indonesia. Inshallah. My honor, inshallah, inshallah soon, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, Prof. Yasser and Dr. Dewi. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, so now we will welcome our next keynote speaker. Alhamdulillah, already with us today. We